morning. I'm Agamoni Ganguly Mitra. I'm a research associate at the Mason Institute, which is a research uh, network based at the University of Edinburgh. We are um, an interdisciplinary network aimed at investigating the interface between uh, medicine, life sciences, and the law um, in relation to medical and bioethical developments, both at a national and a global level. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Sarah Chan, who is a Chancellor's Fellow at the Usher Institute for Population Health um, Sciences and Informatics here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Sarah is trained in biology, law and bioethics and has spent several years working in, uh, um, sorry, in science policy and bioethics. Um, and I'm also very pleased to say that Sarah has recently joined the Mason Institute's Executive Committee as Deputy Director. Thank you, Sarah, for agreeing to speak to us today about your research interests. Would you perhaps like to start us off by telling us about your research interests in bioethics and your background? So thanks very much, Argo, for that kind introduction. And may I say what a pleasure it is to be here and to have joined such a vibrant team as the, as the Mason Institute. I'm really looking forward to being part of the group and working with you all. So my background, as you, as you said, is in science and law before I came to bioethics. So I actually started off doing lab work, wielding a pipette and so forth. Uh, and after that, I got into science policy. And I was working in Australia at the time around the area of embryonic stem cell research. And it's virtually impossible to work in policy around embryonic stem cell research without becoming embroiled in the ethical arguments. So that was really what sparked my interest in bioethics. And shortly after that, I moved to the University of Manchester, where for the next 10 years, I was working first with the Center for Social Ethics and Policy, and then the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation. Uh, my research at Manchester was broadly speaking around the ethical and social issues uh, raised by new biomedical technologies. So the areas that I've written about in the past inc include human enhancement technologies, um, genetic modification, uh, an area that's obviously topical again now with the work around genome editing and embryo genome editing. Uh, I've continued to work in the area of stem cells and the issues I think around stem cell research have now moved, although the use of embryos does in some ways remain controversial. I think the really interesting ethical issues here now are around the development of new treatments um, and around experimental therapies and the use of human biomaterials. As part of that, I suppose, I, I also have an interest in research ethics more broadly. So the question of what it means to participate in research, uh, the question of who counts as a participant and who should who should be allowed to participate are uh, areas that I've been, I've been developing an interest in more recently. Wonderful. Um, so let's get started perhaps with, with your interest in research ethics. Do you think research ethics currently is broken? So we have the framework that we have around human participant research for what are good reasons. We have an approach to ethics in research that focuses very much on protection of the research participant. Um, informed consent is, is very central, but perhaps almost to the extent that it is starting to lose ethical meaning. So you get people talking about consenting the participants as if it's something that's done to them, rather than as what it's supposed to be in ethical terms, which is an, exp an expression of respect for their autonomy as, as persons. And I think bioethicists are agreed that the framework that we've developed over the last century for research ethics is increasingly inadequate to deal with some of the challenges that are being raised by new forms of research. So, for example, research involving human biomaterials, uh, tissues or cells that have been removed from the body, or research involving data, genetic data, health data. How do the issues change when we're not talking about a standard clinical trial where somebody is uh, having a, a drug administered that affects their body directly, but when we're actually talking about the uses of these separated parts of yourself, whether they're physically separated as in the case of biomaterials or separated from you in the sense of data. 
how should consent be different? For example, when I'm simply talking about whether or not someone can use some of my leftover cells versus whether or not they can, they can administer a drug to me. So I think all of, these, all, all of these issues show us that perhaps we need to think again about research ethics and, and how it works in the context of the science that's being done today. So I guess so much of our health system or medical progress is so very dependent on research, on successful research taking place. It's somehow an important pillar of what we understand uh, in terms of health and healthcare. Do you think um, there is a duty to participate in research? So this question of a duty to participate in, in research is something that has been considered within bioethics particularly recently. Uh, and I think again with respect to the new forms of research that are emerging. It might seem almost counterintuitive to expect that people have a duty to put themselves and their bodies in the line of fire, if you like, um, for, for a clinical trial, although many would say that um, there are still good moral reasons that we ought to do so. Um, I suppose to run, to run through the argument very quickly in support of a duty or an obligation, or we might even just say in support of the argument that it is morally good to contribute to research. As you said, um, many of the benefits that we enjoy today uh, have come about through, through medical research. We know that there are still a plethora of conditions for which more research is required. And we, if we can benefit people by taking part in research, then so the argument goes, perhaps we ought to do so. Now, whether or not we want to call it strictly a duty is a point that's obviously un, under discussion. Uh, but I think what needs to be acknowledged is that, as well as the potential risks of being involved in research, there's also an opportunity cost to not doing research. So, in other words, if we can support, if we can support something that's going to benefit people, then that's something that prima facie we, we ought to be doing. And I think that becomes even more the case when we're talking not about subjecting yourself and your body to some dangerous procedure, but perhaps simply saying yes to the use of your tissue sample. Let's say you've had some sort of biopsy procedure, the tissue would in the ordinary course of things be discarded, uh, but you have the choice to opt in and say yes, you can use this for research. This is a very small imposition on you. It could have potentially huge, um, huge cumulative implications if we are given access to those sorts of resources. So the reasons against doing it become, I think, increasingly weaker. And we get more to a point where we think, well, actually, perhaps we should be contributing to the system that has supported us, to the system that's given us the the benefits of biomedicine that we have today. And if we can do that very simply and without great imposition or harm to ourselves, then yeah, perhaps it is something we ought to be doing. So if not even a strict duty to participate, there seems to be something to be said about the idea of reciprocity. So the idea that we benefit as patients as part of a system that needs to develop, that needs in order to attend to our needs. And therefore there in some sense there is a duty to reciprocate that by somehow contributing to the system by participating or by allowing our tissue to be used or data. Yes, and I, I wouldn't say it has to be strict reciprocity. We're not talking about an eye for an eye here or whatever metaphor you might use for reciprocity of benefits. Um, but more that systemically, I think, we, we benefit from science or we ought to, to benefit from science and therefore if we can do something to support it then we, we ought to. So it's a beneficial social institution and we ought to contribute to those sorts of things. Um, now the other side of the equation of course is how much is science benefiting us? Who is benefiting? Uh, and I think the idea that science is a social enterprise, that it's something that we have a duty to support and in turn it benefits us, really starts to break down if the benefits are not flowing back to us. So for example, um, when we are prevented from gaining access to the benefits of science because of 
very strict, um, very strict exercise of intellectual property rights. I would say that's something that breaks that, that sort of life cycle uh, in the same way as if we paid taxes to support an education system and then were not permitted to send our children to school, we'd feel that something was, was perhaps broken there. So I think it's important to realise that any duty or obligation or even any moral reasons we may have to support science also rely on that assumption that science is going to, is going to generate benefits to which we will, have, we will have access in an equitable way. So we talk about the right to try, but what kind of a right is it? So do we really mean that it is a right where we then have the obligation to provide people or whoever wants to access these experimental interventions with the ability to do so? Or are we really talking more about getting rid of some of the impediments towards accessing these interventions? How would you describe this right? So when we talk about a positive versus a negative right, in terms of a negative right, we would just be saying, let's let people do as they wish. Uh, we won't get in the way. Um, we will let patients and companies trialling new medicines transact between each other, and we won't get in the way. And if we're talking about a positive right, we might go a step further and say, ah, if a patient wants an experimental intervention, then the state should perhaps bear the cost of that. I think that brings us to... Uh, a point that I think we really, that I think is very important to talk about, because as soon as we start talking about the cost and about who pays, and in fact, in your question earlier, you mentioned um, you mentioned the market and getting access to treatments before they come onto the market. I think we can't ignore actually that market forces and commercial factors are a huge force in driving the development of new therapies, and this is where actually. I would say we should, we should have a note of caution. So in a simple situation where a potential treatment is available, a patient wants to try the treatment, uh, they are making that decision uh, freely, and we, we judge that that's a decision they should be allowed to make, then fine, let them go ahead. But in fact, patient decisions, new interventions, um, experimental treatments don't operate simply like that. There are a whole range of forces that shape people's decisions, that shape what treatments are offered. So I think that one of the issues we, one of the issues we face is that the development of new treatments is driven both by patient need and demand, but also by the market in the sense that if there's a demand, a market is created, and therefore there's the opportunity to profit from it. Now, having the discussion about the effect of commercialization and the effect of the market on therapeutic innovation is an entire different can of worms. Um, but I think at the very least it's fair to say that at the very least, it's fair to say that we need to be cautious, I think, about profit as a driver for this development. In the case especially of early access to treatments, I think we need to be hugely cautious because what... We need to be hugely cautious because what the past few decades have, have shown us, I think, in terms of a market that is increasingly opening up to letting products come to market and be sold ahead of rigorous proofs of, of efficacy, is actually that people are paying money for treatments that may not be effective, indeed in some cases for treatments that, um, that are actively harmful, uh, they don't have access to full information, and that information never comes to hand. So in, in other words, while giving people hope is certainly worth doing, that, ha that hope, I think, has to be backed by some, some genuine possibility, both the possibility that this will eventually lead to a therapy and the research that's, that's going to... to 
try and test that in order to make it a, a proven therapy. The danger is that by opening up access to experimental interventions at too early a stage, they remain experimental. So if you look at it from a very cynical point of view, I suppose, um, if you are a company whose aim is to sell products, if you're able to sell them, why would you then go on and spend the money to test them, to make them better, to make sure they're, they're safe to improve them? So I'm not saying by any means that the only motivation for the industry is profit, but it is a driver. And that driver is satisfied as soon as you're able to sell your product. That, that driver doesn't require that you achieve genuine therapeutic benefits. And so I think we just need to be aware of the effects of those commercial forces. Yeah, there's, there's just so many interesting questions that you're picking up on there. Um, so in terms of what you've been saying, both regarding the duty to participate and the, the note of caution you had there regarding uh, can we ensure that the benefits are flowing back to patients, are flowing back to our community and so on. Um, and again, talking about the right to try versus you know, um, the other forces and the other actors involved in how these um, experimental therapies come about and then uh, go onto the market and so on, talking about profits. So for people like you and me who work with, with research ethics, who work with regulatory frameworks, how do concepts of duty to participate and right to try and things like that, how should we um, sort of embed them in, in what we know as research ethics, given what you've talked about in, in terms of caution and forces and actors at play? So taking that question in two parts, um, one of the criticisms of trying to assert that there might be an ethical duty to participate is saying, look, we can't conscript people to participate in research that runs completely counter to all of the ethical notions that, that we've developed. And indeed, the, the motivation behind thinking about whether there might be a duty to participate isn't that we're going to start hauling people off the streets and subjecting them to research against their will. That would indeed be a violation of all of the principles of, of ethics as, um, as they've developed in application to human participant research. But I think, nevertheless, th there is worth in developing the idea not to incorporate it into regulation, but maybe to change people's perceptions and assumptions mm -hmm. around scientific research. So I said at the start that the framework that we have is very heavily focused on protection of participants. And I think perhaps we need to recognize that Scientists, by and large, are not out to get us. Scientists are not mm -hmm. there trying to, trying to harm patients, mm -hmm. trying to violate their autonomy. Um, I think we need to recognize that there are benefits that scientists are also trying to do the right thing. Um, and by saying, well, you're doing something, something morally good, even if it's not a duty, but you're doing something good, you're contributing to your community, uh, your contribution to a valuable social enterprise when you choose to participate. I think it's a, a change in perspective, even if not one that we would want to put into regulation in any way. As far as regulation around a right to participate or a right to try, uh, that's a question that is very much, um, very much topical at the moment in terms of proposed changes to UK legislation, in terms of the the right to try movement in, in the US. Um, as I said, I, I think we should proceed with caution in this case. Um, I am not sure that the benefits of granting early access are necessarily going to flow to the patients and, and to society. Uh, so I think this is an area where I'd say, actually, we need to be much more, much more careful about simply letting people do as they wish. What do you think our role should be as biases in, in this movement, in these discussions? Could we be doing research ethics better? <laughs> so what, what do bioethicists do? That's yes. a question that I often ask myself. I think the... So with respect to policy, I think bioethics has two main hats, or at least two at least two hats to wear. Uh, and one is the realm of the quite theoretical, where we abstract out the issues, 
uh, we engage in moral philosophical analysis and we come to a, a conclusion about that situation as an abstraction. But I think when it comes to talking about policy, we need also to we need also to be able to take all of those contextual factors that we've abstracted away in our, in our original analysis, we need to be able to take those on board and say, well, if we were, for example, to grant any kind of, um, any kind of policy effect to the idea of a right to participate, what would the effects of that be in practice? If I say that, look, on the grounds of autonomy, I think people have a right to say no, why shouldn't they have a right to say yes? Uh, then that's all very well. But is what's going to happen in practice that people have greater control over the way their lives go with respect to treatments? Is it going to be an exercise of their autonomy? Or are there actually going to be other forces that shape that beyond, beyond that simple analysis? So I think we have to balance both of, both of those roles. So as you know, at the Mason Institute, as I said, we're an interdisciplinary team, and you're not... Um, a part of this team, what do you think are the challenges and the advantages of being part of an interdisciplinary team? What, what's good about and bad about interdisciplinarity? In oh, well, as, as I said, I think it's a great team to be part of. Um, and one of the exciting things for me is getting to work alongside not just other bioethicists, uh, but also lawyers, sociologists, anthropologists, people doing science and technology studies. And I, I think there are, I, I'd say it's both challenges and opportunities. On the one hand, to, to bring bioethics back to the real world, you know, we claim to be a branch of applied ethics. For our work to have application, we need to be able to encompass those other perspectives, um, the contextual factors that help us to understand how the more abstract decisions and analysis that we conduct are going to play out in the real world. And so I think for, for that reason, it's very important that bioethics takes a more multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary view. So the work of, um, the work of other scholars in terms of telling us you know, what, what, what the world is actually like um, outside of our abstractions, in terms of looking at the ways in which we could put our ethical ideas into policy, um, I think that's all tremendously important and that's why Groups, groups like the Mason Institute, I think, serve such a valuable role. But I think there's room for both. I think it's nice sometimes just to be disciplinary and to say, here we're just, today we're just doing bioethics, we're just doing applied philosophy. And then we might come out of that and say, how do we relate this to the broader picture? And that's where we bring where we bring in the perspectives of our colleagues from other disciplines. So in summary, I think there's, there's room and there's need for both disciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Um, once again, thank you very much for talking to us today. Um, and again, welcome to the team and we very much look forward to having you on board and collaborating. Thank you, it's been a pleasure and I too look forward to working with the Mason Institute in future. <laughs>